record, go live. Okay. Move your timer. Done. Okay, I think we are officially live. So happy Monday, folks, and welcome to episode 43 of Change School TV, our weekly dose of inspiration for your Monday mojo and mindset reset for the week ahead. Now, tonight we have Dr. Gareth Thompson joining us live from the UK as part of our Humans of Change series. Dr. Gareth, thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Saul. Hi, folks. Great to have you here. Now, we, Gareth, um, we were recently connected through a mutual friend, and I absolutely loved hearing about your journey of making the career shift um, in probably, I guess, most summarized terms from practicing medicine to becoming an entrepreneur in order to enable and empower more ecopreneurs to address our greatest sustainability challenges. Now, I thought it was such an interesting story that absolutely had to be shared with our community of, you know, either career shifters or aspiring career shifters. So I'm really, really grateful for you um, taking the time to be here. Great. Happy to share. Thank you. So I'd like to kick us off with a brief intro to you and the work that you're doing um, before I basically give you the floor to share your story of following inspiration to do what lights you up. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So folks, for those of you joining again, this is episode 43 of Change School TV and we have Dr. Gareth Thompson with us here tonight. So Dr. Gareth holds an MBA from the London Business School. He's a medical doctor and has several years of consulting experience um, working with startups in the healthcare and sustainability sectors, as well as small boutique agencies and a top three strategy consulting firm. Currently, his work is focused on inspiring and educating the next generation to build a wave of eco startup companies that address environmental problems in order to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. He's committed to achieving a truly sustainable global society to protect the earth and the prosperity and health of future generations. He believes the sustainable development goals highlight that planetary health is the single biggest influence on human health and well-being. How did I do, Dr. Gareth? Sounds amazing. <laughs> 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 awesome. <laughs> so as you shared with me, your career journey hasn't been a linear one, and that tends to be the norm for anyone who's made some big shifts in their career and their professional direction. So my hope for tonight's chat is to really try and trace back on your journey and connect all the dots so that our viewers who are joining us live tonight can really take away some inspiration and insight and hopefully some practical tips from your story that they can take into their week ahead. So shall we dive Fantastic. in? Yeah, sure. All right, let's do it. So I always like to start from the beginning. Um, so maybe you can kind of walk down memory lane and tell us a bit about what made you decide to become a doctor. Um, what made you choose this line of work and what was the sort of trigger or pivotal moment that made you decide to do something else? Yeah, cool. So <clears throat> going back to when I was 18 years old, I was first and foremost, I'm a scientist. So I remember very clearly when I was like six years old, I got given a book by my parents called 1500 Fascinating Facts. Okay. And it was all about science. And the first page you open up and you get a picture of the solar system. Right. And I remember being, wow, what is this? And then I read the book back to front like 10 times. And then I'd go around telling people, you know, all these scientific facts. And they're like, who's this crazy kid? What was he talking about? So anyway, for, first and foremost, I, I'm a scientist and I've always been really into science. I was quite altruistic as a kid as well. My mum's a nurse and I think she had quite a big influence on me. Um, she, didn't, she wasn't like a pushy parent to say, you, you've got to be a doctor, you have to be a doctor. But she, she did show me that that was a potential career path. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, like a lot of 17-year-olds, right? Yeah. When you make that kind of choice to go to university. I knew I was into science, and I knew I was quite altruistic. 
and my mum was a nurse, so I thought, you know what, maybe I should be a doctor. That that sounds cool. And and literally, that was the decision making of a seventeen year old. <laughs> and so I found myself in medical school at the age of eighteen. Wow. Which is not a bad place to be. No. Um, but I've, I think probably halfway through medical school, I started to wonder, and I I kind of thought, well, I'm not really sure about this. That this is okay. I can do it. I'm. You know, I'm, I'm competent at this, but it's, it's not, there's something missing. And that was as far as, it was my intuition stirring up. Yeah. Um, and I, I voiced that concern at the time to parents, friends, and they're like, oh, it's just university. Don't worry about it. You know, just see how it goes. Finish your degree. So I finished my degree. And then when you finish your degree as a doctor from medical school, you, oh, well, you might as well be a doctor for a bit, right? Yeah, sure. And so I did. And, and I ended up doing a few years as an accident emergency doctor. And I was good at that. And, and it was kind of, it fulfilled a lot of the things I was looking for in a career. It was very fast paced. It was science based. Um, it was a big challenge. And I found I was quite good at multitasking and doing lots of, crazy things at the same time as you do in an emergency department. But again, this feeling got stronger and stronger and stronger mm. where I need to be doing something else. I don't, I don't know what it is. And way back then, I actually, uh, I did explore a little bit. So I remember going online and I found like an early version of CST of, of the career change school. Yeah. A very early version that was in the UK a few years ago. And I, you know, I got one of their career changers workbook and I just filled it in out of curiosity. And it was really interesting because the, the questions in it were so simple. You know, the, it was so basic, but it, it, took, it, it, it gave me an awareness that what was missing from my career was creativity. Mm. And this was a big surprise for me because I'm a, sci- I'm a scientist at heart and sure. the workbook was telling me, you're a creative person. And... It, I was intrigued by it, but I didn't, I actually didn't hold any faith in it. I was like, no, that's weird. That's not, that doesn't, I'm not sure about this. The other thing that came out of it was I should write a magazine. Oh, wow. (laughs) I should be, I should write, I should form my own magazine. And this is probably around when blogging was becoming, was becoming a thing, but not yet, not really, not yet. Yeah. And so in my head, I was like, how do I start a magazine? That's crazy. That's, that's, you know, so I parked it, but the creativity thing, did chime with me a lot Mm. and I knew that there was something in that and I knew that's what was missing from my career and I'd come to the realization um that I needed to creativity for me wasn't like arts and crafts creativity it wasn't quite that far in the spectrum right and it was somewhere in the middle so I came to the realization that I really wanted to work on big projects Mm. to make an impact something where I can take the lead on something that has a creative element to the creation of something new. Right. And That's that was, and that was a big step forward as well. And I did a lot of exploration on that. And, and I came to the conclusion that, well, look, I've done a few years as a doctor. I'm a trained professional. I want to work on projects that have a big impact. And at that point I researched business schools and MBAs because MBAs tend to attract that kind of, that kind of mindset. A very yeah. ambitious mindset where you want to make a big difference. Sure. And I thought, wow, the business world, yeah, there could be something in that. That that is really intriguing and it's really outside of everything I know. Yeah. And so I went for it. And I did my MBA and I was thinking at the time, what I want to do is work in big healthcare projects. I didn't know what that looked like, but I thought I'll go to business school and I'll see where it takes me because that will be a very good way to do that. Maybe I can join an NGO, maybe join a big corporate that works on, on health projects um, and or work as a consultant, which I wasn't really aware of until I went to business school. And if I could just interrupt you for a yeah. minute, though. So when you, at, at, at that point from, let's say, you know, I know it's not quite um, point to point, but between the time that you sort of had these discoveries and, and realized or were able to define what was missing from your career to the point that you went into business school, 
Can you walk me through a little bit of what was going through your mind and how did you, so, I mean, were you panicking because it was something so different? And I know going, you know, becoming a doctor, it's an investment, right? It's an, mm -hmm. a financial investment, investment of your mm -hmm. time. Um, and then, I mean, lucky you, you're, it sounds like you had a lot of support around you, but was it difficult to explain the desire to go back to school? School, to pursue something very different how did you kind of reconcile that I was panicking in a sense that I thought oh my god what I've gone down the wrong career track right. and you know as you do you think if only I'd done something like this a few years ago right. and that's that's a painful rec recognize you know when you recognize that in yourself it's very very painful yeah. um, and so but I was still young so wasn't really panicking from that point of view Sure. You know, I recognize that, okay, I'd gone down a slightly wrong career path, um, but I've got an opportunity and I can really, I can go into business school will give me that, that chance to do a 180 degree turn. Yeah. Um, and by the way, it's, of course, for the people listening, it's not the only option. I, and I'm not suggesting that you need to right. go to business school because it's a really big move. Right. I mean, I was pretty reckless actually in that move because not from a panicking point of view, but I was very, very keen to change direction quickly. Right. And so I really dived into this without really understanding all the implications. And and maybe it's something I continue to do to this day. It's maybe an entrepreneurial trait, but which we'll yeah. come into that later. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just dived in and, you know, it it wasn't easy and I didn't have the funds to go to business school either. Right. I had some of the funds and I thought, I'll just, you know, I'll just figure out a way. And I got lucky and I got a scholarship. Awesome. And my dad lent me some money and I borrowed some money. I got like a student loan to do a master's degree. Luckily, I'd paid off my debts from medical school. Uh, so I was in a relatively fortunate position, timing wise, I think, with the global economy and everything. Right. Um, but yeah, it, it was difficult, but I, threw, I just threw myself into it and I yeah. just did it. Yeah, and that's on. kind of... A little bit reckless, but also a little bit maybe who I am. Sure. Uh, and and so I ended up going to business school just to open up a new door. And it certainly, yeah, it opened up an entirely new world, mm -hmm. which I loved. I loved business school. The whole experience was was massive eye-opener, a big confidence builder. It really stretched the horizons of what I thought was possible for my career. Um. Maybe a bit too much, but we'll go into that again later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's good to cast a wide net first, I guess, before yeah. you go down, right? Rather than mm, cutting yourself short on possibilities from the get-go before you actually, mm. right, really see how far you could go. Yeah, and it's a wonderful feeling. You know, you, you shouldn't over-plan things sometimes. It's really good to have, just to open up possibilities. Just go for it. Just do it. Um, and and see where it takes you. Yeah. And and be and be open to multiple possibilities. Don't be too prescriptive. And I guess I was thinking I'll go to business school and I'll get a job at the end of it. Right. And it didn't quite pan out that way. But we can go into that when we go through the uh, the next few questions. Yeah. Sure. So I mean, maybe so. So you got into business school, and yeah. what was that like? So you did. To what extent did you get to sort of uh, dictate or steer the direction that that was taking you? Because I guess MBAs mm. can be quite broad, right? Depending mm -hmm. on which program. So how? Yeah. How did it kind of shift and shape your course, or how did you shape it? Yeah. Well, it, you have such a bewildering range of options when you start an MBA, especially when you come from a non-business background. Right. So broadly speaking, you're open up into three main tracks. Um, you can go and work for a corporate, what they call, what they call industry. Mm -hmm. You can go work in financial, um, like banks and so on, the financial sector, private equity, venture capital funds. Um, there's a whole, you know, there's an entire, entire range of careers in there. And the third one is consulting, management consulting. That's kind of your typical MBA career paths. And then, of course, the fourth one is entrepreneurship. But at that stage, I wasn't even thinking about entrepreneurship. Right. Um, I was thinking, I'm just going to go and see what this is all about and, and get a job at the end of it somewhere. Um, and 
the pace of an NBA so quick is so fast that it's bewildering. I was on a year and a half course, but already within three months, we were being asked to decide where do you want to do an internship? Oh, wow. And it takes a lot of prep to choose where you're going to go. Are you going to go into finance? You're going to go into corporate? You're going to go into consulting? And I was new to the business world, so I had absolutely no idea. What, I didn't even know all, all these options exist. How am I going to choose one? Yeah. I was able to safely cut out finance because I'm not really a mathematical numbers, hard-nosed money person. I knew that. Right. Um, and so, I, okay, I can work for corporate or I can do consulting. And then consulting, management consulting is a really good way to work on varied projects and build up business skills. Mm. And so I thought, okay, let's have a look at this and, and I'll, I'll go for a management consulting internship. And that is a lot of work and a lot of effort because anyone that's done consulting, they do something called the case study interview method. Right. Where the interviewer will take you through business cases and you have to then work out a solution to the problem there in front of you over a half an hour or an hour. It's a very, very intense process. Super intense. Yeah. It sounds like yeah, it. Yeah. And I guess being a doctor, I'd like, okay, I'm, I'm, this is hard, but I like challenges. So I'm going to just throw myself into this again. Sure. Um, but again, at that point, it was weird. My intuition was, was crop popping up mm. I was doing that management consulting interview training to say, are you sure about this? Are you sure this is maybe you want to be more free spirited than this? And I'm like, what is this crazy voice in the back of my head? <laughs> Why? I just came to business school. I'm doing something totally different. And yet there's this thing in the back of my head that's saying, are you sure about this? Is this the right thing? Mm. Um, but uh, so the pace was so quick. I went through it, did the interviews, and I was lucky enough to get a, uh, an internship with one of the top three firms. And that's what I did with my summer mm. um, after the first year of the MBA. Um, Working in management consulting was great because it was a huge eye opener, a completely different world. I'm in the business world. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Kidney candy shop. Um, and then, but a few months in, I realized there was a lot of parallels between what I was doing in medicine and what I was doing here in consulting. Mm. This was a very structured, a very structured process that, that you go through yep. where it's service delivery. And there's not a huge amount of creativity, which is that thing that the Career Changes workbook kept on pointing to. Right. There's not a huge amount of creativity in management consulting. There's a little bit, to be fair. Mm. There is some, but maybe not enough for me. And so I had, I, I, um, I knew that that was lacking and it wasn't, that this was not what I was going to make a career out of. I could do consulting for a while, maybe a year or so, pick up some skills. Um, but I knew it wasn't going to be me. That wasn't going to be my career. Right. And when I went back to business school to complete my MBA, I took an entrepreneurial class. I took a couple of entrepreneurial classes. And the first so entrepreneurial class. So you shifted class tracks, took, basically. Uh, kind of, yeah. There, there was in the second year, you get to take whatever classes you want right. to. Okay. So even if oh, you're going to be a electives. consultant, yeah. yeah, you take electives. Sure. The second okay. year is all electives. So you just choose what you want to, what you want to do. Great. And I threw this entrepreneurial class in there as a wild card. I thought, that looks interesting. Let's see what this is all about. And I was hooked immediately. I'm like, wow, I love this. I love it. This is, this is what I've been looking for. Mm -hmm. this, is the this is the creative element I've been looking for. It brings yeah. all the stuff together. Um, but of, of course, and we don't take linear paths, right? And I've just gone through business school. It's very expensive. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I've done some management consulting, but I know that's not the career I want to end up doing. Yeah. Um, I want to be an entrepreneur. How the hell am I going to square the circle here? Right. And that followed. I loved business school. Doing the MBA was fantastic. But then I came out very confused. Right. Because I knew I wanted to do entrepreneurship, but I've just done an MBA. It was extremely expensive. I had now had some student loans to pay um, and I need to start working. So I did some consultancy work, mm -hmm. but it wasn't enough to keep me going. So I had to go back and do some clinical shifts as a doctor again. Mm. And that was 
although it was something I'm trained to do and I can do it quite well, it was very painful psychologically to go back and do that. Sure. Um, it was very painful um, after making such a big investment in a yeah. big career change and discovering that I want to be an entrepreneur was not the ideal. <laughs> that was not the ideal result of an MBA. You don't sure. need an MBA to become an entrepreneur. Yes. It actually helped me a huge amount. I mean, it, it gave me an entire range of business skills right off the bat. Yep. But there, there are other ways to become an entrepreneur, right? If you know that's yep. what you No, do. I think that's a, that's a really great point. I'm glad you're saying that. I mean, not to undermine anything that you did. And I think there's a lot of value. I mean, I actually also recently did a, a mini MBA course for, you know, because I think there's never any reason not to learn more, right? And to gain yeah. more knowledge. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. It's not a prerequisite or a requirement to become an entrepreneur. Um, and sorry to interrupt, but I mean, just hearing what you were just saying, like in hindsight though, and I, and I hear you because I think when we're in transition, especially between jobs, unfortunately, we often have to do certain things to make ends meet that can be painful, right? Especially if it's kind of having to go backwards in time a bit, um, doing things that we may not love, but are able to, do you think you would have done it differently? Yeah, I think I think I would have probably jumped directly into entrepreneurship had I been aware right. that 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 was the best path for me. However, the MBA actually triggered that in me. Exactly. Yeah, made me aware that entrepreneurship was what I wanted to do. So I can't right. really turn the clock back. Yeah, because that was the trigger. Yeah. Um, but for anyone else, I would say just do it is yeah. number one. Right. And and you know what, an education getting an MBA is is a fantastic thing, and you can build those business skills doing courses or going through programs. Exactly. Yes. Things that are more focused. Yeah. And then an investment in education is never a waste, right? I mean, yes. I have, I now have access to investor networks. I have access, people, people take me seriously because I've done an MBA. Yes. So there, there are actually, it's not black and white, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and having an MBA is a huge advantage as an entrepreneur the connections I can make, the network yeah. I have for what I'm doing right now. Yeah. It took me one week to get in touch with an investor who, who said, I'll put money into your new business. Right. Um, and that wouldn't have happened without an MBA, not, not as easily. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Cool. Um, sorry, I just had to jump in there because I think there's so, yeah. I mean, we could have a whole other episode around that, unpacking that. And even for myself, you know, when I went through the mini course, I also probably shifted, um, what was initially more of a biased view around the value of having an MBA to now, you know, kind of having a more balanced view on there's always stuff to learn and it's nice to have that theoretical kind of foundation it's mm -hmm. nice to have the exposure, to have the network, like you said, but it also kind of reinforced for me the value of learning by doing. I mean, nothing yeah. beats the experience, right? And just absolutely getting knocked down and having to get up again. I mean, right. no case study can teach you a harsher lesson than that, right? No. Um, but okay, interestingly, also, yeah. uh, on, the entrepreneur, on, on the entrepreneurial class I took on the MBA, they said that on day one, they said, look, this is not a substitute for, for being right. an entrepreneur. Right. And actually what we're going to do in this class is you're going to go out the building. Right. You're going to leave the building and you're going to talk to customers. You're sure. going to survey potential customers. You're going to prototype if you can. Yep. Um, and it, you know, so the, the class itself was very practical because they recognized that. Right. Yeah. So and applying it in the real world. That. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 For sure. You got to yeah. get into the real world as an entrepreneur, not exactly. Get stuck yeah. in the theory. Exactly, we're in the classroom, right? No, that's yeah. brilliant. Um, okay, so sorry, I know I cut you off. I'll get us back on track. Um, so, okay, so you've made the sort of, I guess, uh, mental shift and actual shift, right, in terms of having more of the entrepreneurial experience side of things in your portfolio at this point as you're going through the course. So what were some challenges that popped up for you as you sort of started wrapping this phase and chapter and moving into the next and how did you overcome them? Mm. Um, so, I mean, just on a basic level, like I, I went back and did some clinical work 
to right. keep some yep. money coming in while I figured yep. out what to do. And I did some consulting as well, yep. uh, which was nice because that got me to do something a bit different away from the clinical practice side of things. And then because I, I knew I wanted to do entrepreneurship, I started searching for opportunities um, and started networking mm. in the health tech sector because mm. there's some there's there's some fantastic stuff happening in innovation science and innovation health tech and i thought okay health tech startups this 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 is a cool space this is my next move and um i i did that i worked on and on, in and on with um helping out health tech startups with different founders different companies nice. and considered working in one or two of them um, which is a tricky process as well because you need to get to know who your you know your co-founders are. Yeah. Who you're going to work with? You're going to join. You're going to join a team, get yeah. equity, and then go for it. And so I did that for a year and a bit, and then I I knew I wanted to do my own thing, mm. so I set up my own company to work on a particular part of health tech that uses AI to triage patients. Mm-hmm. Um, which fit really nicely with my emergency medicine background. Yeah. And so I, I formed my own company, but it was more, it was actually a partnership with another company. So it wasn't a full startup. I formed my own company to form a partnership with a company that was already doing some of that work. Sure. And I thought this is a low risk way to get into the entrepreneurial side of things because they're bringing yeah. the resources and I bring me to yeah. the table. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And, um, so I did that for a while. It was it was a huge learning experience, and we got it partially off the ground. Um, but I discovered that the technology we were using was not strong enough. It wasn't disruptive enough, mm-hmm. and there was lots of barriers in the in the health tech space that would stop this from moving quickly enough. In the UK, we have the NHS, right, and it's. It's a big, slow, lumbering organization. Sure. And it is possible to bring in new technologies into the NHS. Um, but it's very slow. It's very, very slow. Right. And I quickly realized that I had to pivot away, end it or pivot. Mm. Uh, when I say quickly, there's a year and a half, couple of years of learning. Yeah. Learned a ton and we built a prototype. We did a trial. We talked to different hospitals, went out to get grants, everything you can imagine right. to, build, to build this thing out. And I, I came to the point where, okay, we could do this, but it's going to be extremely slow. It's not going to be quick. Sure. And the bigger thing is there's probably not a product here that hospitals really want mm. because they're struggling with other major issues that are much bigger problems. Right. Um, and, and that's a very key learning for an entrepreneur. You've got to have yeah. a product that is solving a big problem for, for a customer. Absolutely. And it's important to be able to recognize that too, right? And to be able to know when you need to, as you said, either end it or pivot, right? Yeah. Um, I think sometimes often we see uh, in the startup world, right, getting so attached to certain ideas or products or a way of doing things. Um, And even though the market or the testing that you do is telling you that it's not a product market fit or there's changes that need to be made, sometimes it doesn't happen because we're not willing to, to recognize it. Right. And then do something about it. Right. So that's awesome. And one and and a half years is a short time. In it's a short time, right? I yeah. Mean, you know, <laughs> you got a lot done, I reckon, in a year and a half. That sounds Yeah, like. we had some successes and it was, it was really great to go through the experience. And I think actually it was a prep, it was prep for what I'm doing now. Sure. Yeah. Is the way I see it. You know, you, yeah. quite often entrepreneurs will go through maybe three or four companies, in fact, or three or four ideas or three or four products before you find the one that really sticks. Yeah, or like 10 uh, or 15, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not, it's not a smooth process. It never yeah, is. Exactly. Um, and it's important to recognize where you are and, 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 and pay attention to those very, what can be subtle signals sometimes. I, I, remember we inter- I remember very clearly we interviewed a doctor in a hospital and he loved our technology and he'd actually tried to install like a makeshift version or he did install 
a makeshift version of what we were trying to do, a very mm -hmm. basic level right. in his department. And without the AI, without all the sophistication, but essentially like a patient check-in service. Right. And it worked really well and patients loved it. Mm. And, but what he said to, to me was, and this, is, this was the trigger, he said, every time I go on holiday, the management team tries to uninstall the patient self-check-in. Oh my God. So although patients loved it and, and the clinicians loved it, it wasn't in line with the hospital management priorities because they had right. bigger fish to fry. Right. And that was the first thing that triggered and I, and I thought, oh, wow, no, wait, wait a second, wait a second, something's not, there's sure. something not right here. Yeah. And, and that, you can easily miss that, right? If you, do, if you miss that signal, you just keep on going thinking that patients love it, so it must yeah. be great. Yeah. But the patient was not the customer, the patient exactly, yeah. was the end, the end user, and there's sure. a big difference. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I love it. Okay. So you sort of, so you had that realization and you decided, so did you pivot or did you end it? What happened next? What was the, I, I ended it. I decided to end it mm -hmm. and I didn't know what I was going to do next is the right. honest answer. I, I, I was exploring different ideas in health tech again. Um, I went back to drawing board and I actually went, back to dig a bit dig deep again do a bit more soul searching nice. um, and w the other thing that popped up when I was on my MBA was I was aware of a growing interest in sustainability mm. um, and I, I kind of went to a few talks at business school and renewable energy and you know waste management and global warming and those kinds of issues more out of curiosity than anything else mm -hmm. um, and I did toy I, at the time I remember wow, I, I, this is something, this is interesting. I wonder if I could do something like that. But then I threw the, thought, threw the idea away. No, no, I've got healthcare expertise. That's where I should focus, right? Right. But this, this popped up again and I did some more soul searching and I actually got a, an entrepreneurial mentor to help mm. me through the process. Nice. To find, to find my next venture. And one of the surprising things, working with that mentor, brought up was this that I was very very into sustainability um, it's not like a very deep driver mm. yeah I love healthcare and health tech because of the technology and the innovation side mm. and innovation is the thing is is a really big internal driver for me mm. because it brings together science and creativity sure and I had the science thing from when I was six years old Right. creativity angle I couldn't really figure out because you know I'm not a painter right but actually if you put creativity and science together you get innovation yeah so, absolutely you know I connected very deeply with wow I'm an innovator that that's who I am that's what lights me up and then the other big thing was um there's the sustainability thing which brings in elements of health sure uh, and all these other altruistic sides that are connected to, to human society mm. uh, in a big way and in in something that can make a really big impact. And so he bluntly told me, look, forget about health tech. You need to be in the sustainability space. Wow. And I was like, wow. You're right? And then I was yeah. like, you're right. You're actually right. I can't believe that. Um, and so, yeah, I went back to drawing boards and, and went really deep into what I want to do. And I discovered that through going through that process with a mentor, what I really want to do is inspire and assist people to bring, to create those new technologies mm -hmm. and bring them to market that will make us an environmentally sustainable society, improve human health, have all these positive spin-off effects sure. that are very, very necessary for the future. I love that. Sorry. I mean, I think, you know, it's something that just, it, uh, what I love about this sort of turning point, and I guess the, this, this kind of, yeah, phase of the story is one, helping you to connect the dots, right? And really find mm -hmm. that common denominator. And two is, I think, what's interesting, and, and this is something we always tell our students, but it's hard to, it's not something you can necessarily look ahead and connect the dots, right? It only happens, we always say this, 
um, you know, it happens when you look back, right? When you're able to look at what lit you up, what drove you, what excited you. And I think a lot of times we tend to think so much in boxes or because of, you know, the categories that the job market or the world of employment has kind of created or predefined for us. It sometimes, I believe, blocks us from seeing a much bigger picture. Because mm -hmm. when you say innovation, to me, that's, that's huge. Like, it's so broad, like you said, and it, there's so much impact that can be made. And for you in your specific context and within your individual journey, that can connect your medical, your scientist and all of that. But for someone else, it could mean something very different. And I think mm -hmm. probably you being open and receptive to the process with your coach, right? Or even just actively going and seeking out a coach um, was probably such a huge step, right? In allowing you to take a step back from everything you already knew, right? To kind of wiping the slate clean. And then like you kept saying also, wanting to dig deeper right and wanting to soul search um i love that you're using that term by the way <laughs> um and to in order to really like unearth some of the things that maybe got overlooked or hadn't had room to uh, manifest in your career yet right yeah i mean soul searching is it's funny you brought that word up it, it's kind of like people can see it as kind of like a spiritual thing or a bit weird. Oh, or a bit, yeah. You know, you go off backpacking for a year to, yeah. to, to, to find yourself, that kind of stuff. But I yeah. think, and, and that has huge value, by the way, I meditate, I'm into all of this, that stuff. Yeah. I think it's really important. I don't think any one of those particular methods will get you to where you want to go. I think you just need to go out and, and use all the resources you can get. Yep. Um, but soul searching for me is we're all we're all unique i think as individuals like extremely unique like you're saying innovation could be a hundred different things for different yeah. people someone else that's coming out of business school who's into innovation might be into like fintech financial technology exactly they might want to go and build something for a bank yeah and that's a very different picture from the innovation that i'm into yep and even though we could have very similar backgrounds, very, very different motivators for what drives us to what we want to do. Yep. And it's really important to do that soul searching to find out who you are. Yes. Um, because that's going to decide, that's going to determine where you belong and what, what work really suits you best, right? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And I mean, I guess, I mean, and the other thing I want to say, just in thinking about the title as well, and connecting all of this back to your story, you know, this whole journey, I think of following your inspiration to do what lights you up. I think something that I've kept hearing consistently is your curiosity, right? Mm. Being driven by curiosity, right? Like, okay, what's that course about? I think I'll give it a try. I liked sustainability talks, decided to sit into a couple, right? Mm -hmm. I thought it was health tech. I went and networked. And I think that that also, you know, for some people, this whole idea of maybe sitting down or, or working with someone to soul search might not resonate or it might mm -hmm. seem a bit scary. But I mm -hmm. think another way to look at it, as you've been sharing, is like just being allowing yourself to be driven by curiosity, right? And, and so often I think we make connections that way without necessarily knowing that it's going to happen, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you got to, you've got to follow what you're interested in. To pay attention to what, like, to what you're doing when you're not doing anything. <laughs> exactly, right? exactly. So, you know, one day I was walking along the street and I saw some electric vehicle charging points they were installing in a street in London. Yeah. And I took a picture of the, of the charging points for, for no reason. I just did it. <laughs> I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I took a picture. And then I walked down the street and I thought, why did I take a picture of electric car charging chargers? That's weird. And then I thought, you know what? I've never taken a picture of medical technology that I've come across. Right. Spontaneously. Although I'm into it, I've never been so curious about it that I want to take a picture of something just for the yeah. hell of it. Yeah. So things like that, pay attention to what you're doing when you're not paying attention to what you're doing. 
Totally. <laughs> I love that. It's so true. Um, yeah. And it's something similar that I always say is like, you know, see what you like to do. I mean, what are the things, the activities that you're doing where you lose track of time, right? Um, or yeah. the time that you enjoy doing something and, you know, you, yeah, you just get lost in time. I think those are always signs of like things that really make your heart happy, right? Or make your soul happy or something you really genuinely enjoy. And even if it's not that exact activity, I think it's a really good starting point for identifying those things, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, cool. So, okay. So sorry, I know I keep interrupting you. It's such an awful habit, but I'll get us back on track again. So tell me, where are you now with your current startup work? Is that where we left off? Yeah, more or less. We're just yeah. coming up yeah. to that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I worked with a mentor and discovered, look, this is what I want to do. That I want to create an army of, of yes. entrepreneurs who are focused on fixing environmental problems. Mm. And again, that's quite broad, um, but it, it covers so many different angles and it could be human health, it could be waste management, it could be energy, but it really it's working with startup, it's working with people to create startup companies and to help them to become an environmental entrepreneur or an eco entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And Love so it. the company's called Solve Earth. Um, it's a new venture. So it's less than a year old. And what we do is you can start from zero. You can be an individual and you can do a course to learn entrepreneurship in the environmental space. Awesome. So we have a short online course. It's only 12 weeks. And actually you can do the first module in four weeks. Yeah. So you can just, you can get, you know, sign up to module one it takes four weeks. It's all delivered online and you do it in your own time over four weeks. And then you complete the, the second module if you want to complete the whole 12 week course. And that will take you all the way to a business plan for an environmental startup company Brilliant. of your own creation from nothing. Amazing. Uh, yeah. And then we will help you on your journey to make that reality if you're ready to start the company or plug you into other opportunities or point you in the right direction. For Amazing. So you do that through a coaching um, element to the course or how does that? Yeah, there's an optional uh, mentoring package that you can sign okay. up for as you do the course. Cool. If you want to go deeper and, and are you really serious about it or you can yeah. just sign up for the online course itself. But really, Good. if you combine the course with mentoring, you're going to get a much more, um, much more value out of it, much more in-depth experience. Sure. And it'll take you much closer to starting your own environmental startup company. Brilliant. So you kind of took your personal journey and mm -hmm. turned it into something that would enable other people who maybe found themselves at a similar crossroads or point in their career, I guess. Um, exactly. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Innovators are my tribe. So anyone that wants to innovate, in the environmental space for the betterment of human society. That's my tribe, right? Amazing. Um, I want to help those people and I want to make them aware that this is going to be an option. And it, it, it sounds crazy, but even when I say it now, I know that people watching are going to think, an environmental entrepreneur, what is that? Um, I mean, this, but in the same way that we have tech startups today, yep. Facebook, uh, I mean, Facebook's not a startup anymore, but even Uber and Airbnb, these gigantic... Sure tech startups yeah so tech startups are a huge thing you go back 15 years people weren't really talking about tech startups exactly. it was the start of the internet boom but but really if you told someone you wanted to be a tech entrepreneur what would that mean 15 years ago yep only a very small number of people would understand that now going forward as the population increases and the the, the pressure on on the environment is increasing uh, people are getting richer which is great all these things are putting massive pressure on the environment sure. and we're going to need really powerful solutions to make sure that that doesn't become a problem and so a big problem is a big opportunity Absolutely. and if you look at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals um, there was a report done called Better Business Better World in 
written in 2017 by the Business and Sustainable Development Commission. And they estimated that the value of new market opportunities in sustainable business is 12 trillion US dollars wow. by year 2030. Now that is 12 trillion of, of value that doesn't exist today. Yep. And the way that new value is brought into the market is via entrepreneurs. So I believe that we're at the beginning of a, of a wave of, of environmental entrepreneurs yes. that are going to tap into those opportunities and they're going to fundamentally change everything that we do and the way we interact with the world using natural resources. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. Yeah. And it is only the beginning. So the, the time to do it is right now. Yeah, absolutely. So start getting equipped, guys. And so where, where can folks find out more about your course? And are you okay for them to reach out to you if they have questions? Yeah, they can email me directly. You can find the website at solve.earth. Just type that into your web browser. Great. Uh, solve.earth. And that will take you directly to the website. You can have a look at the events and the courses there. Uh, they can email me directly at gareth, G-A-R-E-T-H, mm -hmm. at solve.earth. If they have awesome. any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great. Awesome. I'll post that link um, when we wrap up as well in the comments as well as, um, well, I won't share your email that publicly. But for those of you who are watching, you've seen it. Gareth is happy to connect. So if you're interested, um, if you're thinking about getting involved in the space or considering a new career down in ecopreneur path, um, Dr. Gareth is your man. And maybe, um, do you want to maybe share a bit about some of the students that have come through and, and the types of people that are coming to you to kind of give people a better idea of whether or yeah. not it's for them, you know? Yeah, to, so it's interesting. I've had two different types of, of students come through. Yeah. One is sort of university level or just after, just post-university. They're still, you know, very open to all kinds of possibilities. Right. Um, or they've come out of university and they're like, hey, I'm into, I'm into entrepreneurship. I don't know what to do. What, what do I do with that interest? By the way, I might be interested in the environment as well. Yeah. Well, here's a way to combine them. So it's a university, post-university crowd. There's, mm -hmm. another, there's another interesting segment of the older generation people who are very environmentally conscious or sure. they're near the end of their career. Right. And they are looking to, to, to understand this opportunity mm. and get connected with younger people to solve some of these problems. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So you're also kind of bridging two very different groups, I guess, around shared values and, yes. and a common goal, right? Yeah. And when yeah. it, as, as, so the bigger picture for Solve Earth is that we, we want to build a space as well for eco startups to come together. And when that's going to be online and offline. And that older generation will come in the form of mentorship as well. I think that'd be a good way for them to get involved. Yeah. And they can pass on what they know to the yeah. younger generation coming through, coming out of university, who want to make these changes. The older generation can show you, look, this is the way the world works today. Let me help you change it and we'll, we'll, we'll change it for the future. Yeah. Based on what we, based on how the world works today, right? Yep. Oh, I love it. It's brilliant. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing about that. And folks, again, I'll be sharing the link later on, um, but definitely check out Solve Earth if what, um, if everything Dr. Gareth has shared about Solve Earth resonates with you. So before we wrap up, Gareth, I'd love to just kind of, you know, you've shared so much um, and thank you so much for, you know, really going back in time and kind of walking through the different phases with us. How in summary could we kind of look at what have been the most valuable tips or tools or lessons that you've drawn from your journey that you could share with our viewers tonight for them to kind of think about or maybe start taking into the week ahead? Yeah, sure. I, I think the first, the first tip I would give you is, is don't do it alone. Get some help. Um, get, talk to as many people as you can. Be as open as you can. Mm. Sometimes it depends where you are on the journey. I mean, if you, one of the things about my journey is that for a doctor to turn around and say, you know what, I'm not sure about this, that can be, it's almost taboo. And yeah. you can get that in a lot of different careers if you're in, maybe an engineer, a lawyer. Um, even if you've, you know, even if you've come out 
of university having done an accountancy degree for example and you're like I don't want to be an accountant it can be quite difficult to admit that yeah to other people you can admit it to yourself difficult to admit it to other people yeah but the sooner you do it the more input and support you'll get um so you know don't don't keep it to yourself get as much yeah. help as you can and other that, people man. will give you lots of new ideas on how you can make it happen as well yes I love Second it. Tip I would... <laughs> yeah, no, it's hugely important. I mean, I was, honestly, I didn't open up as much as I should have done for that reason. Because, like, it, it felt taboo to, to even say it to some people. Yeah, absolutely. And they're going to go, why would you do that? Why would you, why would you not want to be a doctor after spending so much time studying and, and all the rest of it? No, but you exactly. know what? Something's not right for you. Don't spend years. Don't spend years and years doing something you don't want to do. The yeah. quicker, the second tip is the quicker you make an effort to change and make the change, take action, make a change, the better. Yes. Um, it took me a lot longer than I wanted it to. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I wish that was quicker, but I can't go back in time and change that. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so get help and move faster. Mm -hmm. Go for it. I love it. Get help and move faster. Thank you. I'm just judging these down so I can capture the gem, them again in the comments um, after this. But thank you for that. And I really, I mean, I think everything you shared is super valuable, but I really love um, this comment about not keeping it to yourself. I think that's definitely something um, I would say, particularly in our neck of the, wor uh, of the world, where there's a lot of cultural pressure as well right, around what career profession and direction we go yeah. into. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, there's kind of like the big three, right, the engineer, the doctor, um, you know, the lawyer, what have you. And I think that one is being really forced or feeling that pressure to go into those areas, despite what our, our deeper passion or, or soul might be saying. And then two is, you know, a lot of the times as we're starting to see more and more people in that sector wanting to move out, I think there's a lot of fear and hesitation around vocalizing it, right? Yeah, or yeah. even if taking that step, being able to go and look for help um, and tell as many people, as you said, right, as possible in order to get like those ideas. Um, and actually yeah. on that note, just out of curiosity, I mean, I think, is it from what you've seen, is it very common for doctors to move into entrepreneurship? Like, do you know a lot of um doctors who've made a similar shift as you i do know i do know it's not very common <laughs> yeah um there there is a program that just started in, in the uk called the clinical entrepreneurship program oh cool um, and it's run by a guy called professor tony young okay uh, and he actually takes doctors and other clinical people to teach them entrepreneurship and you can do entrepreneurship as part of your training to be a doctor Oh, UK, super cool. Which is a really big, big change. Yeah. Um, so I do, but it's not common. One of the things he said to me is there's only one of you in every hospital. Right. Right. You know, so yeah, it's, no, it's not common at all. Doctors sure. tend to be more service delivery orientated people on the whole. Right. And, and if you're more into innovation, uh, you might be on the research side, for example, rather than the clinical side. Sure. Um, so, yeah, it's not common, but I do know a few, and I know a few that have gone through business school as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that's brilliant, and that's so cool that they're, I mean, it's good to see education as a whole evolving, right, with how things mm -hmm. are kind of cross-pollinating and mm -hmm. moving us out of silos, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm always happy to hear that. Just to go back to your point on the, the cultural part of it as well. Yeah. There's, there's, there's you know, the, there's that pressure that, you know, you talk about the doctor, lawyer, engineer yeah advice that's handed down from from previous generations our parents generation and beyond yeah and, and you know what that was good advice for the for the for their world when they were Absolutely. growing up Absolutely. but this world is different and this is a positive spin on it because those were the those were the you know those were three of the the lucrative professions if you like sure. Sort of sure. traditional middle class professions that people go into um but this world is going to need people who are interested in, in going down very niche paths yes. because we need innovators everywhere. Everything needs to change. So if you're into fashion design, there's a space for you. Yes. 
no joke, to be a plumber is a really important job right now. And, and we, we don't value people that do like crafts pe- people. We don't value trades people as professionals. Yeah. And actually, you know, plumbers can be, and to take it on a sustainability angle, they can work to install advanced renewable energy heating and cooling systems in people's houses. Yep. Um, that's part of plumbing, right? Yep. And uh, so we, we need, there's so much space for innovation through everything that that advice is no longer applicable. Yes. And it was for a previous era. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what I would say. And so yeah. don't, don't be afraid to break out of that because the future is very different. I love it. I, know I love lawyer, that you framed I know it lawyer that way. innovators, you know, there are people that are shaking up the way law is practiced. Yes. There's artificial intelligence that's taken over from low level legal work. Yep. Um, and people are building that. Some of them are lawyers that are interested in tech. There, there, there's so much opportunity outside of the, the normal career path, the, the normal career paths, even in those professions. Yep. And there's so many professions that are going to be emerging that we don't even know about yet, right? right. So I think you're yeah. spot on in, you know, I think innovation or the innovative and growth mindset is just something all of us really need to continually cultivate in this new world, right? That's actually kind of just evolving and, and completely shifting right underneath our noses. Yeah, even if you don't want to become an entrepreneur, to be, innov- to be innovation-minded is going to be a huge advantage exactly. Exactly. because jobs, regular jobs are changing so fast. Yeah. Um, but you need, to, you need to be able and willing to change as they change. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. See, this is why we connected so quickly <laughs> on our first call and right. why I knew we had to have you on the show. We um, spoke for like 45 minutes or something. I know. We did. It, it was so good. And all the while I was like, I wonder if you'd be willing to tell me this story again in more detail and at greater length <laughs> with our community members. So I'm so glad you said yes. Thank you for doing this. Um, Welcome. Thanks. It's, it's really good for me to go into it as well. Yeah, um, it can be it, it can be difficult to go back and and discuss the hard bits of the journey, but yeah. it makes it makes me more grateful for where I am today as well. Absolutely. Uh, by sharing it with other people, so yeah, thanks very much. It was good. Yeah, and did, I mean, I don't know if I missed out anything. Is there anything you wanted to add that we didn't get to cover, or anything at all? Please, by all means. Uh, I have a discount code for anyone that's interested in yes. taking ah, module awesome. one. The four-week module of the of the Solve Earth Foundation course, and the code is CSTV twenty, and that will get you twenty percent off um, for everyone in the CSTV community that's interested in taking that four-week course online. Awesome! Thank you so much for that. So it's all caps CSTV twenty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so I will post that in, guys. And again, that's twenty percent off for the Solve Earth course module one out of the four modules. I'll recap all of this in the comments, but thank you so much, Gareth, um, for sharing that with our community. Um, Now, before I let you go, I just want to thank everybody who's joined us tonight live, and I hope you drew some inspiration and some fresh juice for your Monday mojo and mindset reset for the week ahead. Um, Dr. Gareth has shared some amazing nuggets of wisdom that I will repost Um, in the comments if my partner in crime, Grace, hasn't done already. Um, But thanks again, Gareth. And for those of you um, who've been following us, just so you know, um, we are closing today the next intake of our Bold Career Move live course. And we, however, we still have our self-paced version on um, rolling admission. So I think I've posted the link already. I will repost it again. But if you did draw inspiration from Dr. Gareth tonight and feel that um, you're ready to take the plunge to start working through a process that will help you to uncover, you know, really what your drivers and motivations are and how you could maybe shift the direction or even just level up and grow and go further in your career, then definitely check it out. It's at bit.ly slash BCM light, but I will post that link inside the comments. And last but not least, guys, I know I've said this a few weeks 
in a row because partly because I've been sick, my head's been foggy. Um, but officially next week I am off for a mini sabbatical for myself. So you will not be seeing me here on Monday nights, but you will see my PSC, Grace, on the show. Um, and we officially kick off with Nemo very soon. So you'll hear about our brand new series on how to be unapologetically you. Same time, same channel. And until then, I hope you guys have a great week. And Dr. Garrett, thanks again so much for being here. Um, and I hope you have a great week ahead. Thank you so much. Have a good time in Portugal. Well-deserved rest. You. Thanks so much. <laughs> and we'll connect soon. We'll keep in touch while I'm there. Cool, cool. Yeah. Talk awesome. soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.